Hopefully this will be informative. When Kristen was telling me what time we were going to do this, it gave me a little pause because I have three sons that are 10, 8, and 6, uh, and so chaos can break out at my home at any time. So we're going to try to get through this as uneventfully uh, as possible. And really the purpose of this is to provide some information about uh, spinal surgery and if it makes sense for your particular situation. Um, as Kristen said, I'm from Pittsburgh originally. Um, I've been at Rothman now for eight years in practice. Uh, I did my residency at University of Pittsburgh, and then I did fellowship at Jefferson. Um, and I was trained both on the ortho and neurospine surgery side. And I treat adult spinal conditions, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. Um, eighth year in practice, as I said, and operate at Jefferson and at Atlantic Care. So, you know, spine surgery is a pretty humbling position, uh, you know, um, it's, it's a humbling job. It's, it's a humbling position uh, because we see people coming in very vulnerable states. And whenever you mention the prospect of spinal surgery to anybody, quite, uh, on, quite frequently that's followed by waterfalls, tears, and incredible apprehension and fear. Um, and one of the humbling things about what I do is seeing people in this vulnerable state, um, ha them having tremendous fears about what's going to happen to them and then being able to exceed their expectation and take care of them. But if you think about why people are so scared of spinal surgery, it's because I think a lot of people assume that there's unpredictability in what we do uh, and that your outcome is very unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. In addition to that, you know, everyone knows someone who had a spinal operation that did not go well. And so I think the purpose of this kind of presentation is to let you guys know that um, spine surgery is, is very predictable. Um, you know, people might have a fear of flying and, and that fear might be intense, but most people expect to plan the lane to land. And I can tell you spine surgery is like that as well, particularly uh, if performed by one of the spine surgeons at Rothman Institute. Uh, fear is understandable, but there are very, very predictable outcomes with spinal surgery. And really what it boils down to is, do you have a condition that requires a surgical intervention? If you do, uh, there's a predictable outcome. If you don't, then you should not have a spinal surgery. And most of the people who do poorly are people who were poorly indicated for surgery, meaning they probably had a condition that should not have been treated surgically in the first place. So we'll discuss um, today, kind of what conditions the spine surgery work very well uh, for, and uh, if you have some of these symptoms or a condition like this, if you should consider spine surgery or not. Okay, so this is just kind of a brief overview. We'll talk about a little bit of anatomy. I think having a baseline understanding of what's going on in your neck and your back kind of makes uh, frames, you know, a lot of these problems so it's a little bit more understandable. We'll talk about some of the common issues that I see and the things that respond well to surgical intervention. And then some of the advances that we have made in spinal surgery over the past five to 10 years that make people's recoveries a lot more reasonable and better. So a lot of the problems that we see in the spine really starts from the generation of the disc. Uh, the disc is the largest avascular structure in the body, meaning there's no blood supply. And it essentially serves as a cushion between the bones. Uh, it's composed of an outer fibrous ring, which you can see called the annulus fibrosis. And then there's an inner gelatinous portion called the nucleus. And that nucleus sucks in water. Uh, and that is what is the shock absorber between the vertebral bodies. And what happens is as we age, the disc naturally degenerates. So there is a component of this in everybody as we age. It is part of the aging process. The discs dry out and you can develop arthritis. Some people have a genetic predisposition in which this disc degeneration occurs at a more rapid rate uh, than others. Uh, there can also be a traumatic predisposition. So if you have damage, a traumatic damage to the disc, just like a blown tire on a car, it may facilitate the development of more substantial degeneration. The problem with the disc itself is not so much the degeneration because that's something that we all face as we age. The issue is if this degeneration leads to the development of arthritis that then impinges nerves in the back or the neck, that's when we consider um, intervention. And we'll talk about that in more detail in some of the upcoming slides. Uh, but this is just an example of what your disc looks like. Um, so these are 
you know, you know, real disc which have been harvested. And you can see this disc on the left is a healthy disc. So this was from a healthy person. And you can see how shiny it is on the center. And then as we age, it starts to dry out. So this is just a disc which has developed what's called decussation. It starts to dry out. It can no longer, um, it no longer holds water, so it doesn't shock absorb as well. And this is just an MRI, which, which shows that healthy discs, nice and plump, and then these degenerated discs. So I see patients every clinic, uh, every week that have disc degeneration. And disc degeneration in and of itself is not something that we treat. But if it leads to compression of nerves, that's when we consider doing an operation. In your neck, you have your spinal cord. So your spinal cord is your information highway between your brain and your body. It's the way that your mind tells your body what to do. So the signals travel through your spinal cord. Uh, your nerves in your neck supply strength and sensation to your arms. So each nerve in your neck supplies a very specific portion of the arm in regards to motor and sensory function. And so this is a normal MRI of the neck here, and you can see kind of the cerebellum and the brainstem and the spinal cord here, and there's no spinal cord compression. This is a normal spinal cord. This is a cross section, which illustrates the spinal cord and then something called the foramen. The foramen is where the nerve roots exit the spinal column. So this is pretty normal here. This is a normal cross section. And when I see somebody with a neck problem, there's a couple of things that I'm evaluating for. If there's compression of the spinal cord, that can affect their balance, their strength. They may notice issues with dexterity, dropping objects. If they have compression of a nerve in the neck, it will cause pain or weakness down their arm. So each portion, of, each nerve supplies a specific portion of the arm. So for instance, if someone has a disc herniation at the C6 nerve root, what you would expect is pain down the arm in that blue pattern. So down your kind of shoulder, your biceps into your thumb, that's the C6 distribution. And so whenever someone comes to see me with a neck problem and they're telling me where their pain is, I'm automatically thinking where they would have to have compression to cause those symptoms. If they have compression at, at, at the level which is expected and pain, uh, for instance, a person presents with arm pain, C6 distribution has a disc herniation, C6, that's someone we, we may consider treating. But your body is really, it's incredibly complex, but it's also simple. It's almost like, you know, if you turn on your kitchen light, you expect the kitchen light to come on, not the blender to come on. And so your neck is like that. If people have disc herniations all the time. If the pain does not specifically correlate to that distribution, we do not recommend any intervention. Uh, same thing for the lumbar spine. Lumbar spine is a little bit different in that in your lumbar spine, you only have nerve roots. So your spinal cord ends in your thoracic spine and your lumbar spine is just nerve roots. But as in the neck, your lumbar spine, the nerves in your back supply strength and sensation to your legs. So my mother um, had a lot of pain radiating down her leg in the L4 distribution. So she was having radiating pain to her knee, to the top of her foot. So this is my own mother who nursed me, who fed me, who saw me study endless hours in medical school. I lived at home when I was in medical school. And I told her it was coming from her back and she did not believe me. She thought it was her knee. Uh, and so a lot of people can be confused by pain in the legs and don't associate that with actually a back problem. But pain or compression of a nerve in your back will radiate or cause symptoms in your legs. Um, and that can be confounding and confusing to some folks, my own mother included. So what are the, some of the common problems that we see uh, in the neck? Uh, disc herniations. Everyone has a disc herniation. And there's a very broad kind of continuum in the severity of a disc herniation. Uh, number one is the disc, disc herniation actually compressing a nerve or your spinal cord. There are many disc herniations in the neck which aren't compressing anything. And so the first thing is to assess, is there actual compression there? The second is, do they have, does the patient have symptoms which align? So if someone has compression of a nerve in their neck and they present with neck pain only, that's not somebody who we would consider treating with any type of intervention. If they have a neck, if they have a nerve pinched in their neck and they have severe arm pain and it lines up, those are patients where we may rec recommend or consider surgical intervention. Cervical stenosis just means the space 
for the nerves or the spinal cord is being narrowed. That can be narrowed by disc. That can be narrowed by hypertrophy of the ligaments in the neck. That can be narrowed by arthritis. So there's many things that can narrow the spinal column. Uh, but stenosis is just a generic term, meaning that the space is being narrowed. Myelopathy would imply that the spinal cord itself is being compressed. So the spinal cord is the information highway between the brain and the body. If you have spinal cord compression, that can affect your balance and your strength. So in this MRI here, this is a patient who has some spinal cord compression. This is the spinal cord. There's a pretty large disc herniation C5-6 that is impinging upon the spinal cord itself. And so myelopathy is the medical term for spinal cord compression. And that may not present with pain, but can affect your function and your balance. Radiculopathy means a nerve is pinched. And so in order to have radicular pain, that would be pain down your arm, and you would have to have impingement of a nerve in your neck that supplies that portion of your arm. I very frequently see patients with neck pain. So this is an x-ray of the neck. This person has some disc de degeneration, and you can see these bone spurs on the front of the spine. And that in and of itself is startling when you see that. Those bone spurs in the front of the spine are a result of the disc degenerating but those are not compressing your spinal cord or nerves in this particular example. The spinal cord and nerves are back here. So if someone presents with neck pain and bone spurs, that person would never be recommended an operation. Um, this is treated with steroid injections into the joints and physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. Uh, those bone spurs in the front of the neck in and of themselves are not overly concerning. Uh, it's really what is much more concerning is when the pain is radiating down the arm or weakness in the arm or issues with balance and strength. Another common reason that we see patients with neck pain is when there's inflammation of the muscles in the neck. The muscles that support your head are very powerful. They're always working to hold your head upright. Your trapezius is one of those muscles. And when that becomes inflamed, that will cause a lot of pain in your neck. Patients will radiate, have report pain radiating behind their ear. And that's because the trapezius um, inserts behind the ear. And so again, this is not anything that is ever treated surgically. These, this is treated with physical therapy, sometimes acupuncture, tri trigger point injections. This is sometimes when we would consider referring patients to chiropractic care, uh, but neck pain that's muscular is not treated surgically. And then another cause of neck pain is facet mediated pain. So when I showed you this x-ray, the facet joints are these joints in the back of the neck, just like a hip or a knee, they can become arthritic. If they do become arthritic, um, those can refer pain to the neck. And again, that is typically treated with targeted injections. So we talked about predictable outcomes with surgery in this fear that spinal surgery does not work. Patients that come to see me with neck pain, I almost always dissuade them from surgery if that's the only problem. Because neck pain in itself is not a good reason to have an operation on your neck. Uh, that is typically treated with injections and therapy. And the reason being is that people who get surgery for neck pain in and of itself, it's hard to tell if their pain will improve or not. Some people get better, some people don't. That's the unpredictability. And that's why for this indication, we do not do surgery very frequently. Uh, if you just have isolated neck pain in the absence of radicular symptoms or evidence of spinal cord compression. Patients who have spinal cord compression have a very predictable outcome. If your spinal cord is compressed, and you're losing function, you're having issues with your balance or your strength, doing an operation to remove that pressure from your spinal cord is very important to prevent the spinal cord from getting worse and also hopefully creating an environment in which the strength can improve and return. There are factors which can influence uh, if your spinal cord will heal or not. Things like smoking, poorly controlled diabetes, those things affect the ability of the spinal cord to regenerate. Also, where you present, if you wait too long and you present with profound weakness, people coming in and they can't use their hands, we wanna to get to the spinal cord problems before it progresses to that extent. But if your spinal cord is compressed, we typically always recommend an operation to prevent you from getting worse. Uh, when we're evaluating what type of surgery to do, one of the things we look at is the alignment of the neck. If there's a normal alignment of the neck versus a, an abnormal alignment of the neck, that can influence the type of operation that we need to do. 
The goal with these surgeries is to remove pressure from the spinal cord and nerves, and there are many, many different ways to do that. Um, one way uh, is to go in from the front of the neck. That's the most common way. So this is a patient that came to see me. Um, you can look at this x-ray and see there is some arthritis or degeneration of the disc at C5-6. And there's a bone spur here in the front. That in of itself is not concerning. Patient came in and reported pain shooting down her arm, weakness in her biceps, and she was dropping objects. And if you look at this MRI, she has a disc herniation at C5-6. There's compression of the spinal cord and her C6 nerve root is being pinched. So this spinal cord is being dented in. So this is a patient who has arm weakness and pain, has spinal cord compression, and is having issues with balance and strength. This is a clear cut example of someone who needs an operation. Uh, and she underwent a 45 minute surgery. This is called anterior cervical discectomy infusion. So this is an operation done in from the front of the neck. Uh, you remove the compression from the spinal cord. These folks typically go home same day. Her arm pain resolved uh, and she did very, very well. Now, one of the concerns with these type of procedures, a fusion, which has a negative connotation, is that somehow the motion in the neck will be restricted. And with most cervical fusions, uh, motion is not restricted at all. Most of your motion, your flexion, extension, and rotation in your neck come from way up high in your spine. It's called your occipital cervical joint and your, um, your C1, C2 articulation. That's where your motion comes from. So a fusion at C5, 6 is not going to affect motion at all. The concern with a fusion like this is that you could develop arthritis above or below where that fusion was performed. Uh, and that occurs in about 15 to 20% of people. Uh, so two out of 10 people may need more surgery down the line. Uh, but this is a very, very successful operation at removing pressure from nerves uh, and removing pressure from the spinal cord, predictable outcomes. Patients that have ACDFs, these procedures that have arm pain or weakness, typically do phenomenally well. Um, this is another example of someone who had spinal cord compression, but this is a little bit of a different scenario. So if you look at this MRI, the previous person presented had a one disc herniation, it was compressing the spinal cord. Here, this is multi-level spinal stenosis. And this spinal stenosis is congenital. So this is someone who had already a narrow spinal canal to begin with. And then they develop arthritis, which began to compress the spinal cord. You can see here where the spinal cord is being pinched. And this little white area is called myelomalacia. It's almost like if you pinch your fingernail and you see it blanch, that would indicate that that spinal cord is being really pinched and that pressure needs to be removed. You can see down here how the spinal cord, how much more space there is here. So this person has multi-level spinal stenosis and multi-level cord compression. This is a procedure which was done posteriorly, so an operation in the back of the neck to remove the pressure from the spinal cord. And you can see after surgery how that spinal cord is free floating now and that pressure has been removed. And so there are a number of ways that we can do these operations uh, to remove the pressure from spinal cord and from nerves. And typically uh, how we make that decision is based upon an individual case by case basis, sitting down, talking to you and determining what is best. Um, this is a non-fusion option. So this type of operation that I did is called a laminoplasty. And that's a surgery where you essentially have to open up the spinal canal. So this is looking at the patient from the top down. And this bone right here is the lamina. So you cut the bone here and place this plate. And what that does is that hinges open the space for the spinal, for the spinal cord. And that allows the spinal cord to breathe. So this is an intraoperative picture showing that. So this is the bone here. This plate is holding open the spinal canal. And this is the spinal cord underneath. And so this is an, this is an option, one treatment for spinal cord compression in the neck that does not require a fusion. You see these plate and screws, you think this is a fusion. This is not a fusion. This is essentially hinging open each individual le level in the neck to open up the spinal canal so the pressure is removed off the spinal cord. And so this is an example uh, on the left side of a laminoplasty. So that's this, this operation here, which was done for a patient that had spinal cord compression. This on the right is an example of a fusion operation. And this person had to have a fusion in the front of the neck and also in the back of the neck. What I didn't show here 
And the reason this person needed this extensive of an operation is there was a very severe deformity where a chin was falling on the person's chest. They had spinal cord compression, and this required a much more complex reconstruction. So our goal is to do the least amount of surgery possible, to do fusions only when necessary. And that's why it really requires a step-by-step -step kind of evaluation to determine what's best for you. But again, these are predictable outcomes. Both of these patients had spinal cord compression. Both of them needed operations because they were having issues with balance and strength. And both of them regained substantial function in regards to balance and arm pain after surgery. This was done in different, different ways, different surgical techniques uh, based upon alignment of the neck. Uh, and where the spinal cord was pinched. Uh, but both had very, very good outcomes. And spinal cord compression, nerve root compression in the neck, uh, if those symptoms are persistent, surgery is a very good option. Radiculopathy would imply a nerve in your neck is pinched. So this is kind of a cross-sectional, a histologic section showing the spinal cord. And what you can see right here is a nerve which is being pinched out the frame. And this is called the uncovertebral joint which can become arthritic, just like a hip or a knee, and that nerve is being pinched. So patients that present with nerve pain, pain shooting down the arm, uh, we may consider doing a surgery. This was a younger lady who came to see me. If you look at this x-ray, this is a pretty normal x-ray. Alignment of the neck is normy, normal. There's no compression of the, there's no arthritis in the neck. But she presented with severe pain down her arm, weakness in her triceps. And this is her MRI, which shows an extruded disc fragment. So there's a big piece of disc which has squirted out of her spinal canal and is pinching her nerve in her arm. And so this was a person that I did a motion preservation surgery. This is a disc replacement operation where you're going from the front of the neck, you remove the disc, which is pinching the nerve, and then you place an artificial disc replacement. Uh, and this surgery uh, is something that we very frequently do. Um, patients ask for disc replacement sometime. Disc replacements are done if you have relatively normal alignment of your neck and your nerves are pinched. So arm pain, weakness with normal alignment. If you have severe arthritis in your neck, a disc replacement is probably not the best option. And the analogy is if you have a bent rim on a car, you're not gonna just change the tire. Car is not gonna run very well. So arthritis, if, if, there are, if there's substantial arthritis, those segments need to be fused. If there's not substantial arthritis, then we can very, frequently do disc replacement operations. And again, this is like a 30 minute surgery. This person went home the same day, was back to work in two weeks, predictable outcome, severe arm pain, weakness in her C7 distribution, which is her tricep. She had surgery, she did phenomenally well. Lumbar spine issues, again, very common. Everybody has had back pain. I'm 42 years old, I've had back pain. You can't live and not have had, had some back pain at some stage in your life. And again, just like the neck, back pain is not a very good reason to have an operation. And typically I will dissuade people from considering an operation on the back for purely back pain, unless they have some substantial deformity, fracture, or instability. Lumbar disc herniations, just like in the neck, are a continuum. There is a lot of people I see that have lumbar disc herniations, uh, and those herniations aren't actively compressing any nerves in their back. Those circumstances, we can treat those patients with injections, with physical therapy. They're not treated with surgery. Disc herniations are only treated surgically if they're pinching nerves, and as a result of the nerve being pinched, there's pain or weakness down the leg. Again, spinal stenosis, very common term that you may hear. That would imply that the space for the nerves is being narrowed. That space can be narrowed from disc herniations. It can be narrowed from arthritis. It could be narrowed from hypertrophy or thickening of the ligaments in the back. And spinal stenosis is only a concern when it becomes so severe that it's compressing nerves. And as a result of that nerve compression, start to experience pain, numbness, tingling down your legs. Spondylolisthesis is another very common medical term in which the bones are slipping in the back. Uh, if the bones are slipping back and forth, that can pinch nerves and cause a lot of pain. And a scoliotic curve, um, is when there is some malalignment issues in the back. And that can be a problem which has developed since birth. That can occur because of a, a fracture or trauma. That can occur because of degeneration of the disc. Scoliosis is something we'll discuss. 
don't frequently operate on scoliotic curves, and, and I'll t we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but occasionally I do have to do that for some patients. So back pain, uh, I see a patient every clinic. I was in clinic today, I saw 50 people. Um, a lot of people have back pain. Back pain can occur for a number of different reasons. It can occur because you have arthritis in the joints in your back. So this picture here is an example of facet arthritis. The facet joints are the joints in the back, just like hips or knees that can become arthritic. You can have back pain because there's a slippage or translation of the vertebrae, which is called a spondylolisthesis. You can have back pain because of a generation of degeneration of disc in your back. So this is disc degeneration here in the middle. These, this, this MRI shows normal discs, which are white, those suck in water. And then the disc degeneration are dark because they're drying out. You can also have back pain because of a scoliotic curve, which is putting your mus muscle, you know, causing muscular imbalance and causing a strain in your muscles. Back pain in and of itself is typically not a good reason to have surgery. Occasionally, if you have a substantial spondylolisthesis where the bones are slipping a lot, we may consider doing it in those circumstances. But back pain for disc degeneration or even for scoliotic curves, typically we dissuade people from surgery. The reason is, again, there's a lot of people who have surgery for back pain, and those are typically the people that are upset because the outcome is not predictable. Back pain is multifactorial. So if you do a fusion on someone's back for back pain, and you fuse the, you know, you fuse them, and the pain is coming from their muscles, and you fuse their back. You're not going to make them better. So, um, we are are much more conservative about treating people surgically with back pain. And the reason being is that I can't look at you faith in your eye and promise you that your symptoms will improve. Whereas with leg pain from nerve impingement, I can tell you definitively, if, if I do this operation, the likelihood of you getting better is 99 percent. Um, some of the reasons we would consider surgery is if there is a slippage or translation of the vertebrae. So this is an example of a pretty substantial spondylolisthesis. You can see how that bone is slipping. Uh, there are circumstances where people fall and break their bones in their back uh, and have burst fractures. And this is an example of a burst fracture here where there's bones in the spinal canal, fragments in the spinal canal that require surgery. And then occasionally we will do surgery for Scoliosis, scoliotic curves, uh, but not too frequently. Um, I'll, I'll give you guys an example of that. So a disc herniation, just like in the neck, disc can herniate in the back. If that disc herniates and pinches a nerve, that will cause pain shooting down the leg. So this is a pretty big disc herniation. This is a person that came in, presented with severe pain shooting down the butt, side of the leg, foot, um, side of the leg, calf at the top of the foot, had compression of the um, L5S1 nerve roots, and so I did a micro discectomy procedure. So this is an operation where you go in, you make a small incision, you make a window in the bone and you pull out that disc fragment. Typically people who have leg pain, severe leg pain and have large disc herniations, when they wake up from surgery, they have noticed immediate substantial improvement in their pain in their legs. If someone comes to see me and has a back pain only and has a disc herniation in their back, I will never recommend an operation for that. If they have a same disc herniation, but also present with leg pain that lines up and correlates, that's a home run. An operation will help. Uh, and that's why um, it's important to kind of discuss what is actually bothering you and what's what, what's impeding your day to day. Because the decision to, to do an operation is not based solely upon the MRI. It's based upon your MRI and your symptoms and your exam. And those three things have to line up. And that's why we can tell you definitively, I can tell you definitively, if you're going to get better with an operation, if you need a surgery or you don't. Uh, and that's, again, predictable outcomes. If you have a disc herniation, leg pain, an operation typically is very effective. Um, uh, we've had a lot of advancements in spinal surgery. When I was training, people that used to get fusions on their back would be in the hospital for five days um, with six-month recovery. Uh, we now have much more minimally invasive techniques um, to do operations. The whole purpose of these surgeries is first to remove pressure from nerves, second to stabilize the bones if there is some degree of instability. So this is an intraoperative picture showing a, a traversing nerve root right here. This is the disc space which, which has been cleaned out. This person had arthritis of the facet joint which was impinging this nerve, so that's all been cleaned out. And so we're, we're much better at 
doing these operations through much more smaller portals, minimally invasive surgery, and people are out of the hospital in one or two days. So this is an example of a common problem that I see. This person presented to me with a lot of back pain, but also a lot of leg pain, pain radiating down the L5 nerve root just distribution, which is the side of the butt, side of the leg, calf to the top of the foot. If you look at this x-ray, this is a normal level. So that green arrow is pointing at the disc space. You can see how plump that L4-5 disc space is. That green circle shows what's called the neuroforamen. That's where the nerve exits the spinal column. At L5-S1, you can see that the disc is collapsed. This arrow right here is showing a pars defect. So there is a fracture in this bone right here. Now, fracture is not really the right term, but people understand fracture. But essentially, this bone called the pars did not fuse in development. So there was instability created here. As a result, the disc collapsed, the bone slips forward, and ultimately, the foramen gets narrowed. That's the space where the nerve is coming out. That's why this red dot is smaller than this green dot. So the nerve gets pinched as a result of this bone slipping forward. And so this MRI illustrates that. So this is the patient's MRI. The spinal canal itself is wide open. You can see the spinal canal centrally is okay. The problem is the neuroforamen. So this hole is where the nerve is exiting. This little sliver is right here is the nerve. It should look like this, a nice big open space. And so this person presented with back pain, severe leg pain, and was not getting better, had instability and nerve impingement, home run operation. This is a predictable outcome. Had a fusion at L5-S1, so you can see these rods and screws. This cage here, the whole purpose of this is to open up that space so that that pressure was taken off the nerve. This is an hour surgery, uh, was two nights in the hospital, full recovery at eight weeks. Patient did very, very well. So this is an example of someone who had a mechanical issue in the back, slippage of the bones, compression of nerves, had a fusion operation, very predictable outcome. People do very well with this problem. This is another lady that I saw um, who had a slight degenerative scoliosis. So if you look, this yellow arrow is kind of showing these bone spares kind of on the lateral portion of her spine. Now there's a lot of people that have those, uh, but this was just the first indication that her spine was collapsing on that side. She presented and she had severe burning pain in the front of her thigh on the left side and she couldn't walk. The L3 nerve root supplies the front of the thigh. So that made me think, okay, her L3 nerve root has to be compressed. I got the MRI of her back and that's exactly what was happening. So if you look at this cross section here, this white circle is the sac that holds the nerves. You can see this circle right here is the nerve root. On the right side, on the left side, that nerve is gone. You can't see anything. And that's because that spine is collapsing and pinching her nerve. So she has compression of her nerve. She has severe pain in her leg and her pain is getting worse and worse. She can't walk. This is another very predictable outcome. I did an operation on her where I had to go in from the side. I had to remove the disc, which was damaged and diseased and place a cage. And the whole purpose of that cage is to open up that space for her nerves. And then we placed rods and screws in the back again to stabilize the bones. This was an operation, took about an hour and maybe 10, 20 minutes. She was in the hospital one night. She went home the next day. Complete resolution of her leg pain. Predictable outcome. Now, if this same woman would have had only back pain, no pain in her leg, she would not have been offered an operation. And that's why we have predictable outcomes is because we're only going to recommend a surgery if it's indicated, if you are going to get better with this operation, then we will consider doing it at Rothman Institute. And this is just an this intraoperative picture of me operating with one of my assistants, and this was that particular woman. Um, so scoliosis is something that a lot of people develop as they get older, and they develop arthritis uh, in the disc in their back, and that can lead to some imbalance. What is actually a concern is when people start leaning forward. And the reason people start leaning forward is not so much the scoliotic curve in the front, but it's their alignment from their side, from the side. And you lose the normal curves in your back, so you start your head falls forward. In order for you to stand upright, you gotta tilt your pelvis posteriorly, and that's a very difficult 
way to have to walk. That creates the, that requires a lot of energy. And so this is a person who presented to me, if you look, you can see he has a pretty big curve. He has a lot of arthritis in his back, uh, but he also had severe spinal stenosis. So he couldn't stand upright, he couldn't walk, and his nerves were pinched at multiple levels in his back. He had severe compression of his nerves in his back. And so he had a very large operation. This was an operation where I had to go in the front to remove or the arthritic disc. I had to go in the back to open up the space and remove pressure from his nerves. And then he had a multi-level fusion. You can see how much straighter his spine is. Um, this surgery uh, is much more involved. Um, and I probably saw this gentleman for about three months or so before I did this surgery. It was about a six month recovery for him. So a much, much more involved process. Uh, and he ultimately did very well. This is not for everybody. Uh, and so, you know, this is not an operation that I would be recommending for everybody. This is, this is something that you got to sit down. We got to get to know each other. I need to know what your expectations are, your level of health before we undertake these type of things. My purpose in showing this case is there's a continuum in what we can do. There's very minimally invasive operations we can do. There's much larger surgeries we can do. The whole purpose is that the operations that we choose are really based upon what your problem is uh, and what your expectations are and what we can fix. And so this is a gentleman who had a big problem, needed a big surgery. And again, he had a very predictable outcome. He did very well. Uh, but this is not something that we would recommend for everybody we see. This is actually pretty rare. I might only do a couple, one or two of these a month. Um, sacroiliac joint pain is something that we're seeing more and more. Um, that is pain which radiates into the buttock. And that can come from inflammation of the SI joint. That's the joint that connects the pelvis to the spine. This is typically treated with injections and physical therapy. Very rarely am I recommending surgical intervention for this. We will consider an operation if people have severe buttock pain that does not go away and it's persistent. If you get a diagnostic injection and that alleviates the pain, but it's short-lived, then we can do a minimally invasive procedure to stabilize that joint. So this is also a fusion, but a lot different than what you would have in your back. But this is done as an outpatient, it typically takes about 20 minutes. You stabilize that joint by putting screws across it. That's pretty effective for treating buttock pain in the appropriately selected patient. So predictable outcome, if you have pain in your buttock, you get an SI joint injection, it alleviates your pain and it's short lived. That's when you make, we may consider this treatment for you. I've had many patients who have pain in their butt, they get the SI joint injection and get no pain relief. That is not somebody that should get an operation. And so all of these things have to line up in order for, for myself to do these surgeries. And that's why if I tell you you need an operation, I can tell you with confidence that it will that will improve your condition, that you have a good chance to get better. So surgery is frightening. I mean, I get it. Um, you know, this is my life. I dedicated myself to it, and I certainly understand the apprehension. And I will tell you, it is incredibly humbling and gratifying to see people come in in a vulnerable and concerned state, terrible pain tell them they need surgery, they're crying, and then they come back to see you after the operation is done and they, they're crying because they can't believe how much better they feel. Uh, and that's very humbling and gratifying and why I do what I do. I think the most important thing for you all to understand is that this is not a crapshoot. These operations have very predictable outcomes. If you have a certain constellation of symptoms and you have MRI findings which correlate, uh, surgery is very good, very good at alleviating, alleviating arm pain, there's a cervical disc herniation, which correlates leg pain. If there is stenosis for compression of a nerve, um, if you have instability, which is resulting in compression of your, your nerves in your back um, and leg pain, then, then surgery is, is pretty good at treating that. Back pain and neck pain much is a much more dicey proposition. Not in that the surgery is any more complex, but these are circumstances where we can't, no surgeon can look at you and tell you all your back pain or all your neck pain is going to go away. And if you have somebody that tells you that, you should question that uh, because that is, is, is much, much less likely to improve pain. So there's been many studies of patients who have back pain and they have disc degeneration or even arthritis in their joints. It's about a 50-50 proposition if they improve. If you have nerve impingement, leg pain, uh, it's 98% if you don't have medical comorbidities. So uh, these operations have very, very predictable outcomes. And so that should ease the fear 
uh, regarding these surgeries. People are going to be apprehensive about it, understandably so. Uh, but the appropriately selected patient does very, very well. Um, this is just an example of kind of the continuum of what we do. These big operations are what people fear. And we still do occasionally have to do operations like this where there's major traumas or there's very substantial deformities. But most of the operations I'm doing now are looking or like the one on the right. Uh, there was something called Laser Spine Institute, which really did a good job of marketing because you hear laser and that would imply, oh, there's some type of cutting edge technology. Laser Spine Institute was actually a scam and has, has since been shut down. But what is not a scam is that we can do a lot of these operations through very minimally invasive approaches. This results in less complications, much uh, lower amounts of pain in the perioperative period and shorter hospitalizations. Some of that has occurred because of our ability to improve perioperative pain. So this is a multimodal analgesic protocol, which is fancy wording uh, for essentially a pain protocol that we instituted um, to decrease the amount of pain that people have after surgery. And it is, a, it is also a mechanism to decrease people's opioid dependency after surgery. And so we prime different pain pathways before, during, and after surgery, which decreases opioid requirements and gets people up and moving a lot more quickly. Uh, and that has been very, very effective. Most of the people that I'm doing surgery on, the vast majority, if they're not taking pain medicine before or off pain medicine by their first, first post-operative visit two weeks um, after surgery. Another thing is um, when I was training, um, spine surgery could frequently lose a lot of blood uh, and that would require blood transfusions. Blood transfusions are not great because they can affect your immune response and can increase infection rates. So if you got to have blood, you got to have it, but it, it can definitely result in some problems. And so we have developed many mechanisms to decrease the amount of blood that people need. Transexamic acid is a medication that we can give to decrease the amount of bleeding in surgery. There are surgical tools which allow us to kind of do the surgery with very minimal blood loss. Cell Saver is a device that we use frequently in which we recycle your own blood and give it back to you. Uh, and minimally invasive surgery, uh, there's just not much blood loss because you don't have to disrupt the soft tissue. So I do about 500 operations a year. Uh, it's very rare that I have to give someone an allergenic blood transfusion. Most commonly, we just recycle whatever blood is lost in surgery and that is it. And so that is definitely another pretty substantial advancement. Um, since I since I trained in the early 2000s to now. So, I mean, I, I can tell you spine surgery is frightening. Um, you know, I had a young lady today. I told her she needed an operation. She's been immediately waterfalls, and I, I certainly get it. But she has a disc herniation, which is very large. She has severe leg pain, and it just makes me smile because I know I'm going to be able to help her. And she's going to do have an operation, and she's terrified about it. I'm sure she's laying in her bed with her, you know, can't sleep. Uh, but she's going to get surgery and she's going to do well. And there are certain things that surgery fixes very, very well. And there are certain things that surgery does not fix. Uh, and, you know, if you have a, a condition or an issue that surgery fixes, you know, you should consider it. And I think at Rothman Institute, we have multiple spinal surgeons, myself being one. And I can assure you, our goal is not to do an operation. Our goal is to do the right thing and to treat you. And if that requires surgery, so be it. If it doesn't, then we'll send you to the appropriate non-operative provider. Uh, but I think it's important to educate yourself about your condition uh, so you can make an informed decision. So, you know, people fear roller coasters, but, you know, and I think spinal surgery can be a little bit of a roller coaster. It, it is oftentimes a recovery, uh, but but people do, do very, very well. So I hope this provided some insight uh, and some understanding, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Dr. Woods. That was super interesting. Oh my gosh, your boys are so cute. Well, you hear them um, running. I so mean, I'm, my wife is like shushing them in the background. She's like, I, I swear she's gagging them right now because, uh, you know, they're running around. <laughs> I'm seeing kids running up. So, trying to, I also have trying three boys together. and I also hear the chaos beyond the door. <laughs> All right, so we'll get through these quickly. There's a couple in the chat and then I get a couple via email. Um, so the first question is, is there a solution if you have degenerative disc disease at multiple lumbar levels as well as spinal stenosis? Kind of a broad question. Um, there's no solution for disc degeneration. 
we've done, I, I was part of a laboratory where we did a lot of studies, animal studies, and we were, we were essentially res, um, degenerating disc in rabbits. And then we were feeding them all kinds of things, glucosamine and chondroitin, you see that all the time. And we were looking to see if the glucosamine and chondroitin would slow down disc degeneration. We were doing studies in which we were injecting stem cells and gene therapy and all kinds of things to see if we could slow down disc degeneration. Fact of the matter is the technology doesn't exist. You do see uh, people talking about stem cells. The reality of the situation is there's not science to support that stuff right now. So disc degeneration in and of itself is gonna to happen to us all, some people worse than others. Spinal stenosis means your nerves are pinched. There's a lot of people who have spinal stenosis that don't need treatment. Spinal stenosis is treated if you're having pain and cramping in your legs and you can't walk. So if you have spinal stenosis and you have cramping and pain in your legs, then that's when we consider treatment. The first line of that treatment is injections and therapy. Surgery can be performed if that doesn't improve the, the situation. Perfect. Um, uh, the next one is uh, from a former patient. Hi, Dr. Woods. My name is Amy Stella. You performed surgery on my mom in 2015 for a C3 fracture with cord compression after a serious fall when she was 73. We're so appreciative of your thoroughness and approach. She has use of her hands at 81 today because of you. Thank you for your optimism and with your outcome. And God bless you and your family. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, okay. So I have had sciatica down. Um, right left for three months. Epidural didn't work. Anti-inflammatory drugs give no relief. PT has not done anything. Any suggestions for relief of pain going over butt, down the leg to the foot? So that person needs an MRI uh, to evaluate if there is compression. If there is nerve root compression, which correlates where the pain is, then that you may consider surgical decompression at that point. If the MRI fails to show nerves, any substantial nerve compression, then at that point, we typically would order what's called an EMG, which is a nerve conduction study to assess if there's a peripheral nerve problem or some other issue causing the pain, uh, because there are some conditions like piriformis syndrome, which is rare, but it's a peripheral problem in which the nerve is compressed outside of the spinal canal. So that person needs an MRI, and that MRI needs to be evaluated by a spinal surgeon to determine if they need further intervention. Great. And um, just for that for that person who wrote that question, I do have all the contact information if you want to schedule an appointment with Dr. Woods and get the MRI and have him take a look at it. Um, you can reach out to me directly. Um, if a nerve exists between two vertebrae and they are fused, what happens to the nerve? What's the question? So if a nerve exists between two vertebrae and they are fused, what happens to the nerve? So we, few, we very commonly fuse uh, the nerve between two vertebrae. So when you fuse the vertebrae together, essentially what you're doing is you are trying to protect that nerve. And one of the frequent reasons you would fuse two vertebrae together is if they're slipping and the nerve is being compressed. When you fuse that vertebrae, you wanna realign, you wanna pull it back into position. By pulling it into position, that would remove pressure from that nerve. And then you stabilize the bone in that position so the nerve is no longer compressed. And so when you fuse the vertebrae, you're gonna fuse it in a position that the pressure is off of the nerve that should protect that nerve and prevent it from being compressed again. Perfect. Um, what are your typical outcomes for a lumbar laminectomy? So that's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. The question is, why would I do a laminectomy? So the reason I would do a lumbar laminectomy is if someone has compression of the nerves in their back and they have leg pain or weakness. If someone presents with compression of nerves in the back and has leg pain, they, the, the outcomes are very good. 90 plus percent of people are going to notice substantial improvement in leg pain. The things that can affect nerve recovery are things like smoking, diabetes, and chronicity, meaning you waited too long. The operations aren't fixing the nerves. They're simply removing pressure from the nerves. And so people who have nerve impingement in their back have leg pain or weakness, and they get a laminectomy, typically do very well. And assessing your situation and having a candid and honest, honest conversation is important. If you're smoking three packs a day, it's certainly a possibility that you're still going to have some leg pain after the operation. If the, if the symptoms have been going on for two years, you may still have some leg pain. But most people, 90 plus percentage of people have substantial improvement 
with a laminectomy if they have leg pain and they have compression of nerves and if we perform, if I perform the operation. Um, I cannot feel my feet when I walk. Am I a candidate for surgery? Probably not. You can't feel your feet in your when you walk. The most likely explanation for that is peripheral neuropathy, which means that the nerves in your feet are not working properly. If you had stenosis or compression of nerves in your back, that probably would not cause isolated numbness in your feet. You would also experience some symptoms in your legs. Uh, there's a lot of reasons you could have peripheral neuropathy. The most common is diabetes, uh, but that's not always the sole cause. So if you are having numbness in your feet, the first thing to do is rule out nerve root impingement, spinal cord impingement. You should be evaluated. But numbness in your feet, isolated, is typically not, is typically not something that surgery would be recommended for. Um, here, this is a great question. Will every surgeon agree on surgery or not given a similar workup or do legit differences exist? Definitely legit differences exist. There's no question about that. And I think that's one of the frightening things about it, honestly, um, because it's just like when you see an auto mechanic, if you go see one auto mechanic, I don't know anything about cars. And someone tells me I need to get my transmission fixed. And the other person tells me, oh, you need an oil change that can really freak you out. And I can't tell you how many patients I have seen that have seen other surgeons and that other surgeons recommended surgery. And I saw them and I told them they did not need surgery. And I'm not professing to be God. I can tell you every day, I'm very humbled by what I do, but I think that's why it's important for you to understand and educate yourself. Because what I'm telling you is that there are things that surgery fixes and fixes it well. There are things that surgery does not fix well. And I see very frequently in which surgery is being recommended and it's not something I would do. And the reason I wouldn't do it is because I couldn't look at that person and say, listen, you're definitely going to get better. And I can tell you at Rothman, we have a number of spine surgeons. No one's asked, no, no surgeon at Rothman is going to do an operation on you if they don't think it's going to help you. And I think education is important. Because if you understand the baseline principles, then things start to make sense. So, yes, that's a good question. Uh, and I think, you know, I very frequently have patients that I'm seeing for second opinion. Sometimes I, gr I agree, sometimes I don't. Um, and, you know, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with the opinion you got, you get a second opinion. But I, I think understanding the principles of surgery is very important because that can kind of help help your your guideline for your decision making. Because no, not everybody, not everybody's going to agree. People are doing things for different reasons. Um, and, you know, only thing I can tell you is that at Rothman, we, we, we're, we're not going to recommend an operation unless we truly believe it's what you need. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, let's see, I had back surgery, L5, S1, and 98, many steroid injections, last one last month, and it did not work. I have DJD with left hip, knee, and foot pain. Help. That's uh, there's no way I can answer that question. You need to be you need to be evaluated because there's a that's a multi for so you had a, you already had an operation. The question is the pain that's in your leg is that coming from your hip? Is it coming from your knee? Do you have stenosis or compression of nerves above? Um, so you know you have a complex scenario, uh, and you may have a confluence of factors which um, are contributing to the problem. But you need to be evaluated. You need to be evaluated by a specialist. You need imaging, advanced imaging studies of your spine um, to assess your situation to determine if you need more surgery or you don't, uh, because that could be very multifactorial. Um, why why you're having the issues that you're having? Um, here's um, uh, I think this would be a, an interesting question. I would need a posterior surgery. Is there more recovery or is the recovery different if you have to have a posterior surgery? So for for cervical spine, definitely. Uh, if you think about it, all the muscles in your neck that are holding your head up are in the back of your neck. So I typically try to do anterior surgery at all costs if possible. I certainly have plenty of patients that I have to do posterior on. And there's a number of reasons why you might have to go posterior over anterior. Maybe the location of the spinal cord compression, you can't get get it to it uh, safely from the front. Um, I, I've had, had patients who've had, you know, radiation and things to the front of their neck, which would preclude me 
from doing an anterior operation. The biggest issue with anterior surgery is swallowing issues and then it can affect your voice, your speech, because you have to move things out of the way to get to the front of the spine. Now those are typically transient issues, means it, it goes away. But I had a lady who was an opera singer and she just obviously didn't want to risk any change to her voice, so I had to do a posterior operation. Same, same outcome eventually, but that in the post-operative period, those first two to six weeks, people that have posterior operations typically have a rougher, rougher time. There's more pain in the acute post-operative period. Great, thank you. I'm trying to find ones that aren't super specific to somebody's case. Um, if I have osteopenia, but my family history includes osteoporosis, should I be worried about a fusion of L4 to L5 due to root nerve compression? So very frequently see patients with osteopenia, osteoporosis. Osteo, this is that's a continuum. Osteopenia means your bones are softening. Osteoporosis means they're very soft. Very happy. Very commonly happens in postmenopausal women. When you're being evaluated. And so surgeons telling her, if I see you and I, and I have a patient that has osteopenia or osteoporosis, if the symptoms are manageable, we'll send you for injections, prolia injections or something like that to try to optimize your bone health before surgery. If you have a circumstance which can't wait in which you're getting progressively worse, very frequently we operate on patients with osteopenia and even osteoporosis. And there are surgical techniques that we can employ to increase the likelihood that the bones still do heal the concern with osteopenia or osteoporosis, your bones are soft and the bones will not fuse or won't heal. And there certainly is a risk with that. And so you get assessed, depending on the urgency of the situation, if there's time to optimize the bone health. We certainly do that and recommend it. If there's not, then there are surgical techniques that we can employ to, to treat people that have osteopenia and osteoporosis. But that def definitely does increase the risk, um, particularly of the bones not healing together. Okay, just a couple more. Um, MRI diagnosis of a disc pressing on a nerve at S1, uh, PT, and two rounds of injections. At what point would you suggest a reevaluation before or when a severe leg and foot pain return? If leg pain returns. So, so the only way we would do anything about that is if you had leg pain, which was in the S1 distribution. So which is your butt, back of your thigh, your calf, the lateral border of your foot. If you're having back pain or just blood pain in isolation, <clears throat> come continue with therapy, may recommend or consider an injection. It's the leg pain that would be concerning or weakness to plantar or flexion, so you can't put your foot down. Um, those are the two things which would warrant a reevaluation. Um, and last question. I was diagnosed today at Rothman for my MRI with a bulging disc that's pressing on my nerve where the pain is shooting down my leg. Is that what you're saying may need surgery? Not necessarily. I mean, I see a lot of people that present with acute disc herniations and leg pain. Most of the time that will get better with injections and therapy. So I had multiple patients today that came in, had disc herniations that had leg pain. The vast majority of those do improve, about 60, 70% improve with injections and therapy. So if there's not progressive weakness, very commonly I'll be sending those patients for PT and for steroid injections. It's the people who don't get better. So the pain persists in the leg, start to develop weakness despite injections and therapy. That's when we consider doing an operation and the operation is pretty good at fixing that. Awesome. Um, one last comment, which I think is a great way to end it. Thank you. This was very informative and you have a beautiful family, which is very true. Um, like I said, this uh, presentation was recorded. It will be uploaded to YouTube and emailed out within a week. Um, if there was a question that we didn't get to, um, you can feel free to send it to me. You, you all have my email and I also put my phone number in the chat um, and I can share that with Dr. Woods and his team and we can try to get back to you. And if it's not something we can answer via email, I'm happy to help you set up an appointment. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Woods. I know this is like the busiest time of the day, so I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to meet with some of our uh, patients and potential patients. I can tell my wife she can take the gag off the kids now. <laughs> Let them out of the cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right, wonderful. Night. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.